Man, 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 come on, come on, man, work with me. You're not really gonna try to charge me that amount of money to fix my computer. I mean, come on, man, it's gonna take you, what, five, ten minutes? You're not gonna... You don't really expect me to pay this amount of money. Ah, uh, I tell you what, man, if I knew how to fix my own computer, pff, I would not be taking it to you. I would not be paying this amount of money. I mean, if I knew how to, to fix my computer. Well, I'm Eli the Computer Guy, and today's class is on computer hardware repair. The opening bit was, uh, was based on incidents I ran into a lot when I ran the, uh, the computer repair shop. Um, a lot of very simple fixes for the computer, you know, would cost $49 to $99, and people would scream, yell, bitch, and complain. Well, what most people don't realize is when you own a computer repair shop versus do it yourself, is I had bills beyond simply the five minutes it took to, to repair the computer. So I had to pay a receptionist, I had to repay, pay tax, I had to pay mortgage, I had to pay you know, gas and electricity. So the reason that my clients paid $49 to $99 for five to 10 minutes worth of work in their eyes was because they weren't just paying for those five to 10 minutes worth of work. They were paying for all the other things. They were paying for a shop that they could walk into, but they still didn't like that. So this class is, is going to teach you how to fix most hardware issues with your computer yourself. Uh, you don't need a lot to, to fix uh, computer hardware. Basically, you know, you need a, a can of air and your, your handy dandy nifty, you know, scoot it all around screwdriver. This is a great screwdriver, I love this screwdriver. But I fix almost everything with this one little screwdriver. You don't need a lot of tools, you don't need a lot of experience. Most hardware issues with a computer, seriously, a, a 13 year old could, could fix them. This class will be on hardware repair, so we're gonna talk about if your computer doesn't power up, or if the CD-ROM doesn't work, things like that. If you have a virus, that will be another class entirely. Um, when you're thinking about repairing your computer, you should think about whether or not you actually want to repair your computer or whether you should replace your computer. Uh, again, this class is not going to go into upgrading your computer. This is just a hardware repair class, so we're not going to tell you how to upgrade RAM, just how to repair RAM if it's broken. Well, not really RAM, but... Um, the main thing that you need to, to think about is, although you're not going to pay labor costs, it is still going to cost you money to fix your computer. You know, whether it's a power supply that'll cost you $50 or a motherboard that's going to cost you $100, it is still going to cost you money to fix your computer, even if you do it yourself. So before you go into repairing your own computer, you should think about whether you actually want the computer repaired. Many people, you know, have been thinking about upgrading their computer or buying a new computer for a year or two already. Well, why dump $100 into a computer you already know you want to buy a new one? Uh, just go out, spend the $500 to $1,000 and buy your new one now versus spending at least $100 on a computer that you already want to get rid of. Um, when in doubt, uh, if, if there's information lacking in this course, uh, just go to Google to try to find out the answers. Uh, that's where I found out a lot of answers for everything from fixing little, little desktop computers to major server systems. Literally, I just Google the question, you know, wow. if this happens, how can I fix it? And a lot of times I can find the answer in Google. So if this class doesn't tell you something that you think you need to know, just Google it and you'll be good. Um, one term that I'm going to use a lot in this class is something called known good. So known good is used for parts. So known good part. What this means is if you are trying to test uh, components in your computer, it's, it's complicated and a pain in the butt to try to actually use little probes and test to see if each individual part works. What's easier is to use a known good part, basically a brand new part or a part that you know that works, try to use that and then you, you see where the problem is. So we'll go into trying to find, find out if, a, if the motherboard is bad or the power supply is bad. Well, if you use a known good power supply, so a power supply that you know is good, you plug that onto the motherboard and the computer still does not boot up, then you can narrow the problem down to the motherboard being the issue. So known good uh, parts are parts that you know are good. Um, we're gonna talk about a little bit, you know, where to buy your parts in this class. Uh, <laughs> you can ignore my advice on this. Please do not go to eBay. Please do not go to eBay. 
My shop had a zero tolerance policy for eBay, and the reason was, was too many times you would either get bad parts from eBay, as in the parts would come to you bad, or there would be the wrong parts. Uh, and no matter how good the refund policy is, even, even when the, the vendor had a very good refund policy, you still ended up paying things like shipping. So even if you returned a part and they were all nice and good to you about it, you still paid 20 or $30 to, to ship a part back, back and forth. So eBay, you can ignore me on this. I would tell you don't buy anything on eBay. You should be cautious about buying anything online while you are new to this process because again the return uh, process, even if it's easy by internet standards, you're going to be paying for shipping costs. So even if you, you return something uh, and they give you the full refund, well they're not refunding you the 10 bucks to ship it to you and the 10 bucks it costs for you to ship it back to them so you're, you're out $20 at least. You add in a 15% restocking fee, and you can be out 30, 40 bucks really easily simply because you made a simple mistake that everybody makes uh, in the beginning. What I would suggest is if you have a Best Buy in your area or any other uh, normal box store that, that sells uh, hardware parts, uh, hardware computer parts, that you go to them uh, to buy your parts. It's going to cost you a little more than normal vendors on the internet and a good bit more than the vendors at eBay. But you can go in, you can have your part, you can ask questions, and you know, you're not paying for labor. You know, you're not paying 85, 120 bucks an hour for labor. So just pay a little extra money just so you can ask the, the, the seller, you know, what you're buying. Hey, I've got this thing, I need an identical one. Where, where can I find it? That's worth the few extra dollars you're going to pay at Best Buy or, or Circuit City or wherever you're going to go. Um, and then also, why this is good is if you buy the wrong part, you can take it back very easily. Uh, many of these, these places, as long as you don't keep it over 15 days, will give you a full refund. So you don't lose any money if you buy the wrong part. And that whole known good thing, um, <clears throat> well, if you're looking for parts to test with and you think it might be a bad part, you can go and buy it. So you have a, known, you have a brand new part, you can try to use it. If it doesn't work, then you take it back. So. I don't know how ethical it is, but you can do that because you can go, you can get brand new parts, you can put them in your system. If that's not what fixes the problem, then you take them back and you're, you're out a little bit of gas money. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's all there is to it. Uh, let's go in and we're going to start uh, taking apart one of these computers and, uh, and I'll show you uh, the first steps on how to repair one. Okay, now we're going to go over the warnings before we go in and start fixing your computer. The, the first thing that we have to go over is don't kill yourself. It's not my fault if you do. Uh, that, that's actually, I, I put that in the script there. See, don't kill yourself. It's not my fault if you do. Um, by working on your computer, you're stating that you understand that there's electricity involved and that you might get hurt. And if you do really something dumb, you, you're gonna be going to the hospital. Um, fixing computers is very safe. I've been doing it for a long time, never had a problem, but you know, there are idiots out there. So if you want to be an idiot, you could hurt yourself. The first thing that you need to make sure you do so you don't hurt yourself is before you start working on the computer or start actually fixing it, you need to unplug it. So see back here, see this power plug? You need to pull this out it needs to go away, gone. So it cannot be plugged in while you're working on it or you might get a nasty little shock. The next thing is many people don't realize, even though the computer is completely unplugged, it still retains electricity. There's still electricity floating around in this thing. So what you need to do is go over to the front, press on the power button, and oh, this one's good. But sometimes all these little things will whir up and you'll see that there's actually electricity still in there. So, uh, so this one, thankfully all the electricity was discharged, but there could have been some electricity in there. Now, the final thing, is you may have to worry about something called electrostatic discharge. You know when you're a kid and you'd walk across fuzzy floors and then shock your mom, bro, you know, brother, sister, loved ones? Well, that static electricity can damage computer components. All you really have to do is open up your computer and touch one of the metal parts inside, and this will dissipate the electrostatic energy that's in your body. If you're really worried about it, I'm not telling you not to do this, you can go out and buy what's called an EST armband. It's an armband that goes around your arm and that grounds you to the ground. You can do it. I don't do it, but that's technically the, the, the safest way to, uh, to work on your computer. So make sure it's unplugged, 
push in the power button after it's unplugged to dissipate all the energy. Then either touch the metal part to dissipate electrostatic energy uh, before you start working on the computer or get one of those arm mounts. Now the first thing I need to introduce you to is something called BIOS, B-I-O-S, or Basic Input Output System. Now in this class we're not going to go into how to install an operating system, so this is not an operating system uh, like Windows XP or Windows Vista or Mac OS. The BIOS is the lowest level piece of software that actually tells all of the hardware how to work together. Uh, you can put in certain configurations such as boot order. Do you want the computer to try to boot off of the CD first and then the hard drive? Uh, you can tell it um, what you would like it to do if, there was a, if it loses power. You know, if there's a power outage, do you want the computer to come automatically back on or, or just stay off? There are a lot of cool little settings in the BIOS, but the BIOS itself is a, is a very simple thing, but it controls overall how, how the, the, the computer interacts with a lot of things. So I want to take you into BIOS for a second just to show you a, a couple of these things because you, you should know about BIOS before you uh, start working on your computer. So uh, let's boot this thing up and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at BIOS. So we're going to be going into BIOS now. When the screen comes up, your first screen, it'll tell you normally how to get into BIOS. So it says press delete. So we press delete and we are now in BIOS. If that first screen goes by too fast and you can't figure out how to get into BIOS, uh, you can do the age old uh, trick of running your hand over the computer. Uh, the computer keyboard when the uh, the computer boots up. I've had to do this a lot of times, uh, especially with Sony laptop computers. They they move through that first screen way too quickly, so I can never see what button I'm supposed to press to get into BIOS. So a lot of times I just play the keyboard. Uh, you just do that once, you see if you get into BIOS. If not, restart the computer, do it again, do it again, do it again, and finally at some point you'll get into BIOS. So this in front of us is the BIOS. Uh, the the setup utility that, that basically tells a hall how uh, all the little hardware parts should work together. Um, you can see it has a system time on it, uh, the date. It shows you the hard drives that are detected. So a uh, light on DVD rewritable drive is detected and a Western Digital hard drive is detected. Now the main thing that we need to know in this class is the boot order. So we'll go over to the boot screen and it'll say boot device priority and we hit enter to go into this. Now as you see this says the first boot device should be the the floppy device, the second boot device should be the hard drive and the third boot device should be the the CD player. Now especially for you guys since I have no idea what you guys are getting into and you may have some complete idiots uh, playing around with your computer if your computer does not boot up for some reason, go in here because somebody could have messed with it. If for some reason somebody took out that the computer should try to boot off of the hard drive, well then the computer will not boot off of the hard drive and therefore you will never get into your operating system. You'll never be able to use Office or play Doom again because inside BIOS it's been told not to boot off the hard drive. So the first thing that you, sh you should do is um, if your computer won't boot up, go into BIOS, go to boot dev device priority, and make sure that the hard drive is there. If you really want to test everything out, what you can do is you can um, make the, uh, the hard drive the first boot device just to make sure there's nothing uh, else stupid going on. So make the hard drive the first boot device and then try to reboot your computer again and, and see if that fixes your problem. Uh, along the side, it'll it'll tell you how to how to do things. Uh, like here, uh, F10 is save and exit. So I just hit F10, and then hit OK, and that will save the configurations and exit. So that's BIOS. All you really need to know at this point is that. Uh, to, to take a look at that boot priority to make sure that it's actually trying to boot to the hard drive and that somebody hasn't messed with that. Now one of the warnings I do have to give you with BIOS is there is a security tool within BIOS called the BIOS Boot Password. What this does is this allows you to put a password on the system 
so that it will not even try to boot into the operating system or do anything until you plug the password in. So if you're really, really worried about the security of your computer, you can put on this BIOS password and uh, it won't allow anybody to get past that password uh, until it's plugged in. So it makes it more secure than even a, a Windows uh, password. The problem is, is if you put in that password and then you forget what the password is, you may need to buy a new motherboard, uh, especially with laptop computers. We're not talking about laptops right now, but I have seen laptop computers where there is no way to clear that password once it is set and people have had to spend $600 buying a new laptop motherboard uh, in order to, uh, to, to get their computer to work because they literally had to buy a new motherboard. So it's the BIOS password. On desktop computers, sometimes if you pull out the, the little battery, the BIOS battery, um, that will reset your BIOS. Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. And there is also a jumper in, um, it, on your motherboard that sometimes if you set that, uh, that will reset your, your BIOS password. If you set your BIOS password and then you forget what it was and you're trying to reset it, just do a Google search for your computer or your motherboard and, and, and see what they say. Um, here, let me show you real quick. Let me just pull this off of here. When I'm talking about the, uh, the battery, if you look inside, see that battery right there? That would be the battery that you would pull out. So if you pull that out, uh, wait about a minute and then, and then push it back in, that may clear uh, all of the BIOS configurations, including the password. Or, well, it may not, but it might work for you. The first repair that we're going to get into is if your computer does not power on at all. So you, you push in the power button and nothing happens. Uh, there's no whirs, there's no beeps, there's no lights. You just press on the power button and nothing happens. The first thing that you're going to need to do is make sure that everything is plugged in properly. Uh, this sounds stupid, but I've gotten paid very good money simply to, to go to a client's uh, businesses and turn on their search protector. So if your computer doesn't turn on, the first thing that you need to do is you need to go down to the search protector and make sure that it's turned on. Sometimes these things get kicked, they get turned off, people don't realize it, then, ah, my computer doesn't work. Well, no, your search protector's turned off. If that doesn't fix it, you should go and grab another search protector, a known good search protector, one that you know that works, plug the computer into that, and make sure that's not the problem. Again, I have seen bad surge protectors cause these problems and, you know, it, it could have taken my clients five minutes to figure it out. They didn't, so they spent a lot of money. So make sure it's a surge protector uh, is, is plugged in and all that. The next thing is this uh, cable in the back of the computer, sometimes it's not plugged in all the way. So people will like put it in like that and they'll, they'll think it, it's, it's solidly in the computer. So... Go to the computer, go to the back of the computer, pull out the, the, the power plug, and then push it in securely. Urgh, put your strength in there. And make sure that it's solidly in the computer. Again, I've seen this because the computer is under the desk. Somebody kicks the cord a little bit, it pulls it just, the, pulls the power plug just enough so it's no longer making proper contact, but it looks like it's in. Ah, so I come in, I go, uh, that'll be a hundred bucks, please. <laughs> so if the computer doesn't turn on at all, Make sure that the plug is all the way in. Now the next thing that we need to look at is on the power supplies. There's two things that, that, that you need to make sure are, are correct. The first is on power supplies, there is actually a on off switch for the power supply. So you wanna make sure that your power supply is on. So if this switch got pushed the wrong way so that it's off, the computer won't turn it on, on at all. So make sure that the power switch on the power supply is on. This is not the same as the power button. This is the power switch on the power supply. The next thing is these power supplies are used all over the world. Uh, so they, they have different voltages. This is 115. Uh, in the United States, it's 115 volts. In, um, in other countries, such as Europe, it's I think it's 220 volts. This little switch here is what 
makes the power supply either 115 or 220, depending on, on who's using the computer, whether you're using it in uh, Washington, D.C. or Paris. Depends on, on where this switch should be. So if you're in the United States, make sure it says 115. I've seen, again, the computer gets knocked over, this switch somehow slides over to the other side, and then the, the computer won't turn on because it's looking for 220 volts when it's only ever gonna get 115 volts. So make sure the surge protector is good, make sure the, the computer's plugged in all the way, make sure that the, 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 the power supply, power switch is on, and then make sure that this little uh, voltage switch says 115 and not 220. And make sure it's solidly on 115. It's not kind of like out in there in the middle. If that does not fix the problem, then you, you do have a hardware issue of some sort on, on your computer. So what you should do now is you should get a known good power supply. So a power supply that you know is good. If you don't have one, all you need to do is in order to take uh, this power supply out of their computer, there's four screws on the back. One, uh, one is missing one, two, three, and four. You take those out, then you can pop the entire pyro supply out and unplug it from everything. And then you can take that down to your local Best Buy and say, hey, do you have one of these? Um, I think this one's bad, I need to buy another. So you, you go there, you buy a known good power supply. You then come back, and you plug it back into the motherboard and make sure all the, the connections are right. You then try to power on your computer. Again, make sure it's plugged in properly, make sure that little switch is in the right place, make sure the, the 115 is showing, make sure all those other things are working, uh, that you, you didn't make a mistake um, when you were setting it up, and then try to turn the, the computer on. If your computer then turns on, then it was a bad power supply. Hey, that was easy. So that's about a $50 repair. So you just keep your power supply, you just screw it back in, and you're all, you're all good to go. If it's not the power supply, there's only one or, there's only two other possibilities. It is 99.999% uh, chance that it's your motherboard. Your motherboard is bad. So you will need to get a new motherboard, and we'll talk about replacing the motherboard later. There is a small chance it, it's happened, I've seen it, so I have to tell you about it, is your, your power button could actually be broken, right here. So if the power button is broken, you need to, to figure out how to, how to pull the, the front of your little computer case off, if, if you think it might be broken, and just make sure that, that it works properly. Uh, if it is broken, you'll see like some little part is broken off of it. It, it should be pretty obvious. Um, the power switch is not a complicated device, it's, it's simple. It's a power switch. So if it is broken, you'll see that it is broken. Um, you know, so there's, there's not a lot of testing. So that's how you figure out if, if it's the if it's the power supply or the motherboard. Uh, it, it could be the power button, but probably not. If it's a power supply, you just swap it out. Uh, if it's a motherboard, you just swap it out. So, so that's, that, that's how you uh, to fix uh, your computer if it won't turn on at all. Now the next problem you may run into is if your computer turns on but there's no video. So before, what we just talked about is you hit the power button and then there's silence. There's not even crickets. Nothing happens. Then you have a power problem, uh, either a power supply or a motherboard problem. Now if you hit the power button and you hear fans whiz up and you hear something beep, beep, and, uh, and then you, know, you see some lights go on. So something is happening but nothing shows up on the monitor. Then what you need to do is first, you need to make sure all the connections to the monitor are solid and secure. Again, make sure that the monitor is actually turned on. Sometimes it's not turned on. Make sure it's plugged into a surge protector that's working. You know, all the same stupid stuff we talked about with, with the computer. Make sure it's plugged in properly. Make sure that the jack is plugged in all the way. Uh, make sure that the, the, the monitor, the, the, the cable, the, that goes to the monitor is plugged in tightly on both the, the desktop computer and in the back of the monitor. What many people don't realize is that that cable um, screws into the back of the monitor, uh, so sometimes it will come loose, or somebody didn't tighten it properly, and so it's just come loose. So if you, if you push it tight into the monitor, you may get your video back. If that doesn't work, the next thing that you need to do is you need to try a known good monitor. So 
find another computer in the house that's working, uh, and just grab, steal the monitor from it. You're only going to need it for a minute. So steal the monitor from a computer that you know is working. There are absolutely no problems in the world. Haul it down to your computer that's broken. Plug it into your computer that's broken, uh, that you think is broken, and see what happens. Uh, a lot of times, these the monitors are just like any other electronic equipment. They die sometimes. They just die. So your monitor may have died. If you plug in the new monitor and everything works fine, then you know it's a dead monitor. If you plug in the new monitor that you know that works on another computer, but it doesn't work on your desktop computer, uh, then, you, then, then you've got a problem. So go, go put the old monitor back and, or the new monitor back and get your old monitor and we'll, we'll go into it from there. So once you know uh, that it's not a monitor problem, then you can look to see whether it's a video card or motherboard problem. So the first thing that you're going to do is you'll open up the computer and you can either have what is called an onboard um, video port or you can have an actual video card that plugs into the computer. So the onboard video, video port is just right here if you look at it, right here. So this is actually on soldered onto the motherboard and you plug your, your, your monitor into the, the, the video port. Now, if this is broken, if, if this is what you have uh, and you don't get any video, it, there are some ways to jury rig it, but the fact is your motherboard is dead. We'll go in, like I say, we'll, we'll go into replacing a motherboard, but if this is how you have your video going to your monitor and you're no longer getting any video, then it means your, your motherboard has problems. Um, I would suggest just, just replace the motherboard now. Again, you, you can get around this uh, by, by trying to use a video card, but your motherboard has problems. It's only going to get worse, and you don't know whether the entire motherboard will die in two days or two years. So you just replace the motherboard. You, you'll be happy for it. Now, if the video uh, port isn't on the motherboard itself, but it's on a video card, you just need to go in, uh, undo a screw and then pull the video card out of your system. The first thing that you need to check is that the fan on the video card still works. Uh, these are very powerful devices unto themselves and they create a lot of heat. Since the video cards create a lot of heat, many of them have these little fans on them to try to cool them off. Well, what we see time and time and time again is that these fans get gunked up with just gunk and that they don't work anymore. Uh, so you'll try to spin it, like see if this one, see how that just spins easily? That's what should happen. Uh, a lot of times you'll try to spin it and it'll be very sticky and tight, so even if it moves, um, you know, it's obviously not spinning freely. Or a lot of times I'll actually open up the, uh, the case and as soon as I touch the fan it'll fall off or you'll see the fan in the bottom of the case. The reason is, is because it overheated and got gunked up, the fan fell off. As soon as the fan stops working, it then burns out the video card. So if this is the case, you should just need to replace a video card. So go down to, grab, pull your video card out and go down to your local Best Buy. Uh, when you're getting video cards, um, there's three different what are called slots, types of slots that a video card can go into. And so each one goes into a specific type of, of slot. Either PCI, which is the low end type of video card. So there's PCI video cards. There's AGP video cards. AGP video cards used to be the greatest thing in the world a couple of years ago. Now they're, they're not, so, not really used that much anymore. Or there are something called PCI Express video cards. Um, those are the latest and greatest and generally the best. An AGP video card will not go into a PCI Express slot. A PCI card won't go into a PCI Express slot and vice versa. If this is the first time you're ever fixing a computer, you're not planning on building computers, etc., etc., you don't really have to worry about it. Just grab your video card and go down to your local hardware shop and say, ah, I want another one of these and, and they'll be able to help you out. So when you come back and you have that new video card, plug that in. When you plug that in, everything should work fine. Uh, the, the computer should boot up and you should get something on the screen. If you do not get anything on the screen, that means your motherboard is fried. Uh, you have a bad motherboard. Uh, so it's up to you at this point. Uh, again, 
at the end of this, we'll go over um, how to replace a motherboard. Uh, but for, for right now, you can decide, is it worth buying an entirely new motherboard or do you just want to take that, that brand new video card back, get your money back and buy a new computer? you'll have to decide. So uh, so if you have no video, this means you push the power button, you hear fans, things happen, you just don't get any video. First, make sure everything is plugged in properly to the monitor. Then get a known good monitor, see if that works. Uh, if that doesn't work, then pull open the case, take a look at the video card, see if there's actually any, any damage on it, see if it's working, you know, it looks like it should be working or not. Uh, go buy a new video card, plug that in. Uh, if the new video card works, it means you had a bad video card. If the new video card doesn't work, it means you had a bad motherboard. So uh, yeah, that's all, all there is to, uh, to no video. Now, if you don't even get the BIOS screen, so you, you, you turn on the, the computer, it whizzes, burps, whatever, and then all you get is a little blinking cursor, a blink and blink and blink and blink and blink and blink and cursor, or if it doesn't get any further at all uh, past the BIOS screen. So what we were talking about before, when your hard drive was bad or your operating system got corrupted, is it went all the way past the BIOS screen and then it said uh, no operating system found, uh, etc. If it just freezes in that screen, so you don't go any further than that screen, then that is most likely your motherboard. And again, we'll talk about that later. But so if all of you get is a, is a flashing cursor, you don't get any pictures, you don't get anything to begin with, you could just go straight to flashing cursor, or it goes to that BIOS screen and then stops, it just hangs or freezes, then that means it's your motherboard. Okay, so now we've dealt with if nothing happens, then we dealt with if you, something happens but you don't get any video. Now, we're gonna talk about what happens if, you, if things happen and you get some video but then you don't get into the operating system. So you turn on the computer, it whizzes, buzz, burps, and uh, little lights blink. Then on the computer, uh, on the monitor, I mean, you actually get something. Well, if when you boot the computer, when you turn it on, you get that first uh, BIOS screen, uh, like, I, like I showed you before, that means that the motherboard is okay. So if you, if you get that first screen that'll say, you know, Dell computers or Gateway computers or Asus motherboards or something like that, it doesn't look like Windows XP or Vista. It's just that first BIOS screen. That means your motherboard is good. If it goes past that, uh, but doesn't get any further, uh, it just goes past that and then says no operating system found or corrupted operating system, etc. That means you have a problem with your hard drive. Now, one of two things could be the problem with your hard drive. The first is that it could be physically dead. So your hard drive fried, it's dead, it's gone. Um, if that's the case, then you need to just replace your hard drive and then reinstall the operating system. Um, if your hard drive is, is physically dead, uh, we will have a class on data recovery, but that, that's its whole, a whole other business. Um, Basically, all the if the, the hard drive is physically dead, then then all the data on it is gone, and there, there there's nothing you can do about it. So just replace the hard drive, and then um, reinstall your operating system. The other possibility is that the hard drive is physically okay, but a virus or corruption destroyed the operating system. So all of your data is still on the hard drive, uh, but there but the operating system can't function. To, to get you into it. So, you know, it can't bring you into Windows so that you, you can access your data. You have two options here. One is to decide whether or not you really have any data on the computer that you care about. If you don't have any data that you care about, you can simply just try to reinstall the operating system. And when you reinstall the operating system, it'll, it'll, it'll wipe out all of your data. All the data that was on there will be gone. But you may find out your, your hard drive is physically fine and simply reinstalling the operating system uh, fixes everything. So you do that, uh, it's completely free, just a little bit of your time to, again, reinstall the operating system. If there is data on the hard drive, again, that you care about, well, then we'll go into a data recovery class. Because if you try to reinstall the operating system onto a hard drive that already has data that you care about, if that hard drive still works, all the data will get wiped out, it'll be gone. So, so don't do that. Um, if there's data on your hard drive that you care about, 
go take the data recovery class or take it to somebody who knows what they're doing, recover the data, and then uh, reinstall the operating system and, and, and you'll be fine. So if you do have a bad hard drive uh, from, from what we we're talking about before, in order to replace a hard drive, it's, it's, it's very easy. Swapping a hard drive is, you know, will, will take you five minutes. Now there are three types of hard drives uh, that you have to worry about when it, when it comes to repairing a computer. Uh, that is SCSI, IDE, and SATA. These are how the hard drives connect uh, to the motherboard and, and what jacks are used. I don't have a SCSI uh, hard drive here. SCSI hard drives are the creme de la creme, the Rolls Royces of hard drives. Uh, because of that, they are exceedingly expensive. They're five times the cost of any other type of hard drive. So you will not see these very often. Um, you will see these on servers or high-end graphics workstations. So if people are doing video editing or a lot of um, music editing or, or something like that, they may have SCSI hard drives, but generally you don't see them a lot. You will see IDE hard drives with jacks that look like this, if this would, Come on, out of focus. Well, anyways, with jacks that look like this. So this is what connects to the motherboard, and then this is the power jack uh, for the computer, or for the hard drive. So power goes into here, and then a big long ribbon cable plugs into here, and that's what plugs into the motherboard. Now what you have to remember with IDE hard drives is for every cable that comes from the motherboard, for every ribbon cable, you can plug two devices into it. So you can either plug two hard drives or you can plug two um, optical drives or, or like CD drives, DVD burners, etc. Because of this or, or how this is done is the computer makes sure that one of them is what's called the master and one is called the slave. So if you have two, like one, one CD drive and one uh, hard drive plugged into the same cable that goes to the motherboard, one of the, the drives has to be labeled the uh, master and one of them has to be labeled the slave. It doesn't matter which is which, just one has to be labeled that. How you do this is uh, either the optical drives or the, uh, the hard drives have what is called a jumper. And so that is this jumper right here. Now, this isn't focusing very well, but this little jumper pulls out and uh, if you can see that, depending on where this is plugged in uh, on these set of pins, tells the computer whether this is a master or a slave. So this, let's see if this works. There we go. As you can see, this tells you one set of pins is master and one set of pins is slave. So if I decide to make uh, this hard drive the master, then I go, okay, I put the jumper uh, for the setting of the master. And if I do that, uh, there we go. Um, you know, now this is considered the, the master hard drive. Then on your optical drive, you look on the back and see with this one, it shows the master slave up at the, the top here. So then you would set this jumper, you pull that out, you plug it into slave. See, so now it was one is master, one is slave. That always has to happen. If, if you make it so both are master, um, then it won't work, then the computer won't boot up, it won't work right. If you make them both slave, the computer won't boot up and work right. If you only have one hard drive or one optical drive on that, that cable, then you can make it the master or the slave, it doesn't matter. Again, you just can't have, you, you can't have both. So as you have to have one master, one slave, you can have one slave, or you can have one master. You can't have two masters or two slaves. It just doesn't work at all. Uh, so that's the IDE hard drives and optical drives. Now with the, the, the SATA, the, the SATA is the new standard for hard drives. So, so these hard drives are much better and much faster than um, IDE hard drives. And we'll go into that in the, the, the computer upgrading course. We're not gonna go into that now. We're going to assume all you're doing is replacing whatever it is you have in this computer. So 
if you have a SATA hard drive, you'll see that it has uh, two jacks like this. It doesn't have the long uh, thing that the IDE did. And it doesn't have any jumpers. You don't have to worry about any jumpers. With SATA, uh, either hard drives or optical drives, DVD or CD burners, you have one cable that runs from the motherboard to the drive. So you can't put two things on the same cable. One cable goes from the drive to the motherboard. That's it. So you plug that into uh, the smaller little uh, little jack here, and then you plug a special SATA power uh, power connector onto the, the power connector. And then that, that's all you do. So if the optical drive or the hard drive is bad, you just pull it out, you unplug it, you plug the new one in, you, sh you, you shove the new hard drive into the computer, and then you go on and you, know, you, uh, you install the new operating system. So that's SATA, IDE, remember that whole jumper thing. So one drive has to be the master, one has to be the slave. You can't have two masters or two slaves or it doesn't work. You will also see with IDE uh, drives that there is something called CS under that, that jumper configuration, and that is called cable select. Technically, if you put it on cable select, the computer is supposed to automatically decide which one is master and which one is slave. For some reason, that never really works properly. <laughs> uh, I've, in all my years, I've just never seen that work properly, and it causes a lot of problems. So j just make, make life easier on yourself and just make one master and one slave, and you'll be fine. If you, you do cable select and it doesn't work right, uh, then some pain in the butt. So that is, that is your hard drive and your optical drives. Um, how you get them out of the computer itself, uh, it, it all depends. Like this one has little sliders you move back and forth. Uh, some computers you have to unscrew it. You just, just use your best judgment and you'll figure out how, to, how to, to pull either the optical or the hard drive out of the computer and put the new one in. The next repair that we're going to talk about is what happens if your computer just randomly shuts down all of a sudden or, or locks up randomly. So, you know, you, you boot into your computer, you're going along, you're typing, you know, some document in Word, and then boom, whoa, it turns off. Or you're going along and, uh, I don't know, you're, you're creating some PowerPoint presentation and then it <clears throat> freezes. Many times this is not a software problem. It could be a software problem, and we'll talk about that later in a, uh, you know, a, a how to fix your, your computer software class. But many times it is actually a problem with your CPU overheating. You need to realize that your CPU creates a lot of heat. You can boil water off of a, a powerful CPU. So the CPU is the brains of your entire computer. It, it's what tells a computer what to do. If it gets too hot, um, it will melt itself. It literally can melt itself and then just destroy itself. And considering the CPU, that little little thing can cost anywhere between one to a thousand dollars. Manufacturers, they they don't think you you want your CPU to melt itself. So what happens is if your CPU overheats, your computer has a mechanism to shut off your computer. So if your CPU goes over a certain temperature then the computer will just automatically shut off as kind of a self-preservation manner. Well, the way that your CPU dissipates or gets rid of heat is by what's called a heat sink. So in this computer, um, you'll and all computers, you'll see a big piece of like this aluminum thing with all these little fins on it. And then it has a fan on, on top of it. That is the heat sink. So what happens is the heat goes out into all those little fins, and then the fan blows air on those fins, and that's what cools, cools the heat sink down and then cools the CPU down. Well, if a lot of dirt or gunk uh, gets on that heat sink, it is no longer able to dissipate heat properly. So you can go in and uh, with your, with your handy-dandy can of air, just spray out your, uh, your, your, your heat sink and make sure that there's no dust or, 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 or crud on it. Because if there is, th that is probably your problem. Your, your computer is overheating because there, there's crud on your heat sink. To take this a step further, I've actually seen one computer that died of secondhand smoke. If you ever, <laughs> if you ever wanna make sure you never smoke in your life, take a heat sink from a smoker's house and actually look at it. What happened with, with this 
particular person, is after three months, so God knows how much she was smoking, the computer was shut down. I, I took the computer. Um, you know, I couldn't figure out what the issue was. I, you know, the heat sink looked clean, you know, everything looked fine, but it was still randomly shutting down. So finally, I pulled the heat sink out and looked at it, and there was just this, this brown haze all over the heat sink. And I was like, wow, I wonder if that's tar. So I, I took the heat sink, I, I actually used Dawn dish detergent and washed it off in the sink, and all that dirt and grunge came off the heat sink. I put it back into the system, and that fixed it. That was the problem. The computer had died from secondhand smoke. So if your computer is randomly shutting down, go in, make sure there's no dust and dirt, obvious dust and dirt. And then if, if you see crud, if you're a smoker or has been around a smoker's house, just, just take the entire thing out and, and wash it down. That, that's, that may be your, your problem. The next thing is, is the, uh, that heat sink needs to pull in air from somewhere uh, in order to cool the system. So I had one, another client whose computer died of cat hair. Uh, the, what happened when I was, was troubleshooting it was it, it kept randomly shutting down. So as I did, I pulled off the side of the computer, I dusted it out and put it on the workbench and put it through all its antivirus software and all that. And it worked fine, it worked perfectly. So I then slid the, uh, the cover back on and was about to take it back to the client's uh, residence and then it shut down, it froze up again, did the exact same thing. So I was like, I wonder what this is. So I pulled the side off, gave it a lot of air. It was fine. As soon as I put the side back on, uh, it, it, it randomly shut down. Come to find out, in the front of the computer, there's air vents to allow the fans to pull air into the computer. All of those vents had gotten just, just clogged up with all this cat hair. So the, the fans were no longer able to pull cool air into the computer and therefore all the air in the computer was really hot so even though the, the heat sink, sink seemed like it was working it was just blowing hot air onto it and so it couldn't dissipate the heat properly so yeah, th th this is the real world if your computer randomly shuts down it's most likely your your cpu is overheating uh i've i've never seen where it's actually been a bad cpu so don't just run out and buy a new cpu because in in 12 years of doing this business, I've never actually seen it be a bad CPU. It's always that the, the, the heat sink is gunked up or that the airflow has been locked off. So just, just unblock all the airflows, make sure all of your fans are working, and, uh, and, and that should fix your problem. Now, one troubleshooting technique you may have heard of is called reseating. What reseeding is, is sometimes the computer, uh, you know, it just gets jostled around or something stupid happens. And so those little cards that are in your computer, they just become out of a little, little bit of out of alignment. And when they become a little bit out of alignment, that just makes your entire computer shut down or do weird things. So sometimes what can fix your computer every once in a while, it's, it's one of those 5% deals. It doesn't happen very often, but it happens enough that you should think about it, is if you go into your computer pull out all the cards and then put them back in. So undo the, 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 the sticks of memory, so pull them out, and then all you do is reseat them, you just push them back in. Do the same thing with your video card, your modem card, your network card, any cards that are in your system, just do that along with the power supply. Sometimes simply the act of, of pulling these different cards out and putting them back in fixes your computer. Seems weird, but it, it really does work. In this class, I have not talked about memory uh, because memory generally doesn't go bad. Uh, that's not the problem. In the upgrade class, we'll talk about it because sometimes you'll get bad memory and you'll plug it in and that will cause, cause you problems. But day in, day out, if, if that memory has lasted you more than one week without causing you problems, then yeah, it's, it's, probably, it's, it's highly doubtful that you have any issues with your memory. If you think that you might be having issues with your memory, a very easy troubleshooting step to do is memory, um, we talk about memory in sticks. So uh, a stick, let me show you, is one whole card of memory. So if, if you've gone through all these other troubleshooting techniques and it hasn't fixed your computer and you think it may be a memory issue, one of the things you can do is if you have 
multiple sticks of memory in your computer. Uh, most computers you'll actually have like two sticks of memory, so you may have two gigs of RAM. You actually have two one gig sticks of RAM. What you can do is pull out one of those sticks and then turn on your computer and play with it and see if things work a little better. If they don't, plug that one back in and then unplug the other one and see if that fixes anything. If that fixes it, then, then you may have one, one bad stick of RAM, but, but probably not. Uh, but that's, that's reseeding uh, your computer. Uh, so reseeding is unplugging everything, literally all the cards, all the memory modules, everything, and then plugging them back in. Just see if that works. Again, memory uh, rarely fails. But if you're worried about it, if you have multiple sticks in your computer, just pull one of the sticks out, Turn on your computer, see what happens. If that doesn't work, doesn't do anything, plug that one back in, pull another, the other one out, see if that does anything. Um, if that does something for you, then, then you do know that you have bad memory. Now we're gonna talk about replacing your network card. So you can no longer get onto your network, whether it's on the wireless network or the, 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 the plugged in network. Uh, for some reason you just can't get onto the network and you're deciding that you're going to replace a network card. The first thing that I will tell you is most likely your problem is a software issue. It is either an operating system issue or it is an over secure internet security suite. So replacing your network card is most likely not going to fix your problem. Uh, go to the class on, on the software fixing your computer and we'll, we'll teach you about that. But in this class um, it is most likely not your network card. If you do decide that it's your network card, uh, replacing network cards is just very easy to do. Um, all you do is if you, if you have a, a network, an actual card in your computer, you, you unscrew the, the card uh, from inside the case, you pull it out, you put a new one in, and you follow the instructions. Um, if, you, if your network card is on the motherboard itself, so if it's actually on the, on the back here on the motherboard, you still, you just go to Best Buy, you buy a new network card, so it's a, it's a card, you know, that you just buy, kind of like your video card, and you just buy it, you plug it in, you follow the instructions, and then you'll, you'll have your, your new network card. It's very easy to do, just follow the little instructions that, that come with the thing, but just remember that the problem is most likely not a hardware issue and spending that $50 for a new network card is probably not going to fix your problem. Most likely, uh, it's, most likely it's Norton Internet Security Suite. Uh, if you have Norton Internet uh, Security Suite and you can no longer get on the internet, it's most likely not your card. It is Norton. Uh, we'll go into that one later. So that's, that's just a warning with the network card. It's very easy to replace. You just pop out the old one, pop in the new one, or just pop in the new one um, and you'll be fine. Uh, Now, uh, we're coming to the end of the class, so we're going to talk about the motherboard. So, in a lot of these steps, we've talked about uh, your motherboard is dead and needs to be replaced. You should, at this point in time, if, you, if you've only watched this video, you should try to replace that motherboard with the exact same motherboard uh, that's in there now. So, you just buy a brand new uh, of whatever is in there. If it's a Dell computer, a Gateway computer, etc., the best thing that you can do is call up those companies and say, hey, I need one of these motherboards, um, can you ship it to me? If you go this route, it'll normally cost you anywhere between one to $200. Uh, you know, these, these name brand, you know, Dell, Gateway, IBM motherboards uh, are more expensive, but it'll cost about one to $200 and you'll get it in, in about a week. If it's not a name brand, uh, so like, you know, with this, it's a custom Dell computer, then what you need to do is here let me pull you off so what you need to do is you need to go take a look on the motherboard and then see that there where it says p5lmx that's a type of motherboard this is so then you take that and you go on to uh to google and you you try to find another one of these motherboards so this motherboard uh if you look right uh, there is made by Asus. This is upside down, and it's a P5L. Oops, where are we looking at? There it is. P5, uh, P5 
P5L MX. So it's an ASUS P5L MX. So I would go onto Google and I would try to buy an, an, a brand new one of those. Oops. So then you, you basically buy the exact same motherboard. If you cannot find the exact same motherboard, uh, go to the upgrade class and watch that and, and in that class you'll learn enough to try to pick a different type of motherboard. The issue with motherboards is they, uh, they accept different types of CPUs, different types of RAM, different types of all kinds of stuff. So if you just go out and you buy another motherboard willy-nilly, there's a very good chance that, that you're not going to buy the right one and it's going to cost you a lot of money. Like you may buy um, a motherboard that accepts the same type of CPU that you have, but doesn't accept the same type of RAM that you already have. So you'll have to buy the motherboard and the RAM or accepts your RAM and it doesn't accept the processor. So instead of paying $50 for a motherboard, you're gonna end up spending 250 or, or something along those lines. So at this point, uh, again, if you have a Dell, a brand, brand name uh, computer, you just call up, um, call up a Dell or Gateway and uh, have them send you uh, the motherboard. If you have a, a home-built one, uh, just look on the, the motherboard, it'll tell you the manufacturer and then it'll tell you the, the the, uh, the model of it and use that to, um, to, 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 to buy the, uh, the, the motherboard. Um, once you get the motherboard, I mean, it's all, it's all pretty simple. You just unplug stuff, <laughs> you unscrew the motherboard, screw the motherboard back into the, uh, the case, and, and you're good to go. So that's the class on, on uh, computer hardware repair. Realistically, in my repair shop, those were the repairs. I mean, in this whatever class this is, about an hour long class, uh, these are all the hardware issues that we would run into on, on desktop computers. If you understand what I taught you today, you can go off and you can start a computer hardware repair, repair place. Uh, take the next class on, on how to fix the software issues. The main thing that with hardware repair, and this is what you have to understand, and if you're just doing this do-it-yourself, just keep this in mind, is you save a lot of money on the labor because obviously you're not paying you're not paying some tech to fix your problem. The issue is, is if you don't buy quality parts, if you go onto eBay like I told you not to, or you you buy the wrong part, uh, you get confused and you go to Newegg.com and you buy the wrong part or something like this, you can end up losing a lot of money buying wrong parts. So if you're going to, to fix the computer yourself, like I say, try to go to some place like Best Buy and just buy the part off the shelf because if you get the wrong one, you can just return it and then hand it back to them. If you use an online company, remember, even if they don't charge you a restocking fee, you are going to pay all that shipping. And so you will end up paying $20 in shipping to, to ship it back, you know, the wrong part, part back and forth. I would suggest, again, don't, don't use eBay at all my humble suggestion, you'll do whatever you want to do, I know you will. Uh, but also don't buy used parts. Uh, so many of the used parts out there are bad. And realistically, if the only part you can find is used, then it's time to buy a new computer. Um, because you, you most likely are going to end up wasting your money because you're going to send for the part, you're going to get the part, you're going to put it in. And if the only parts out there are used parts, it probably means your computer is already old and obsolete anyway, so you just spent $100 to fix an old obsolete computer. <laughs> uh, I would not, not suggest you do that. So this was a class on uh, the hardware repair of your computer. I'm Eli the Computer Guy, and uh, I'll see you next time.